Tonight's guest is Walter. Walter, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Well, it's great having you. Thanks for coming on. Walter, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Okay. I'm a person that loves the outdoors, and I've always been outdoors, uh, fishing, hunting, uh, target shooting, camping, anything that is possible to do outdoors. I'm a 46-year-old male, and... uh, live in Nevada at the moment, and uh, yes, enjoy the outdoor. Speaking of your love of the outdoors, from what I understand, you like to mountain climb. With that in mind, what's the biggest, tallest mountain you've ever climbed? Oh, that's a great question, yes. Um, Actually, the biggest ever I ever done is here in Nevada. It's called Red Rock Canyon. And there was a 18 pitch uh, climb, uh, I would say about 2,600 feet. Beautiful mountain, beautiful rocks. And uh, for people who know Red Rock in Nevada, they will certainly appreciate the climbing. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it is amazing. Never did have the guts to mountain climb. I'm sure it's a blast, though. It is, it is, it is. It really can make you conquer your fears and uh, um, your limits and uh, put you on to a more understanding of yourself. That's a really deep, uh, is an intern uh, discover of yourself for sure. Well, I can see how that would be the case. You do something like that, it's going to bring you closer to yourself and I'm sure you're going to learn all sorts of things about yourself you didn't know before. Yes, exactly. That's right. You grew up in Italy, Walter. Have you heard about any dogman encounters that have happened there? So in Italy, um, there is those stories and those legends, uh, not as much as maybe a U.S., more in the past, I would say. But uh, yes, there are those, uh, those legends. They honestly... Talking, I never believed before my encounter, and um, I've been stalked by wolfies in Italy uh, while I was going mushroom hunting. I've been seen uh, all kind of animals in the in the woods in Italy and as well in US. But uh, yeah, there are those stories, and like I said before, I never believe it, but. <laughs> Something made me rethink my story recently. And, uh, you know, you know what we're talking about, which will go on soon with you. <laughs> Dogmen are everywhere, so it shouldn't come as a surprise that you have legends of them there. But I'm wondering, how do you say the word dogman in Italian? Okay, in Italian we say it's a, lo- a little longer word. So uh, we say lupo mannaro. Now, the Lupo Mannaro words come from uh, Lupo, which means wolf. And Mannaro, which in Italian has uh, actually a uh, very, very low usage. So don't, people don't use this word much, but means that this wolf is a man eater. So it's kind of a very creepy creature. Uh, that looks pretty much like what we describe here in U.S. as a dogman. And uh, it is really mean and it is really dangerous for what they say in Italy. Because in Italy or in, let's say, in Europe in general, when those creatures have been seen or somebody has an encounter, most of the time on the old history, those people never come back from the woods there was attacked by those creatures. So there's not many testimony about it. Um, Stories, of course, that we hear, they are. For sure, not not like in the U.S., that we have more testimony than in Europe. But I will say, yes, um, kind of a different topic in Europe than in the U.S. U.S. is more open. People like to talk about it more. They are not afraid of, say, stories. That's why I'm in the show, actually, because um, after my encounter, at least for three days, I didn't even talk with my family about it because I was like, 
I might show what I see it wasn't, you know, something different. Do I have to share this? I was really, I was in a kind of shock, after much shock, let's say. But between my, one of my friends, I find your name and he told me, why don't you reach out and share your story? Because he has stories too. And I say, well, you know what, maybe I'll do. Well, here I am. Well, I'm glad he told you about me. And that legend that you're telling us about, that's pretty ominous, the way they describe dogmen over there. Are there that many cases <laughs> of missing persons in Italy? I cannot really answer you that because uh, I'm missing from Italy for a bunch of years right now. I'm living in the U.S. for about 16 years. I've always been missing because I travel all over the world. I've been in Australia. I've been uh, in the Caribbean island. I've been pretty much all over my job was allowing me to travel all over the place. So I'm missing a little bit that kind of contact with my country in some way. So I cannot really answer that. Oh, that's all right. Down the road sometime you might find out about the missing persons cases there, but yeah, it's no big deal that mm -hmm. you don't know right now. You told us about all the traveling you've done around the world. Has your encounter had wide sweeping effects on how you view the world around you now? Yes, it did. Um, let's say that it changes you in a way. It changes you in a way because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm always, always been skeptical of supernatural and all those kind of things or different animals or creatures. I always be skeptical because, like I say, I never had an encounter. I never see anything weird. And I've been outdoor a lot of times. So when you, when you are at this point and you um, feel yourself secure in the outdoor, like I have no problem sleeping outdoor at night, uh, being in a tent, being a sleeping anchor to a rock when I was climbing. So, I mean, uh, fear for me was a very low factor and it's still a very low factor in many things. But as today, Honestly talking, after my encounter, if you ask me to go set a camp <laughs> at night where I was, I would tell you, no, I'm not. I'm not going to do it alone. The only way I'm going to do it, if it's, I'm going down there with my AR-15, then I will feel protected with a friend or two that know how to use weapons. But I will not do that alone in a million years. Well, for more reason than one, it's always a good idea to have someone with you if you head out into the woods or the wilderness anyway, so I'm glad to hear that you do that. If you've had a Dogman encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest on one of my two Bigfoot shows, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let me know. All right, Walter, please tell us about your encounter now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay. So I went to this new area, which I'd never been before, fishing. So I planned the trip I had like I usually do. So getting all my gears, getting my map set up, see the area. And, um, yeah, starting the journey early morning, uh, take my car six o'clock from home, uh, starting uh, in the early morning of a beautiful Sunday morning here in Nevada and, um, heading to Lake Mojave, which is a um, beautiful water reservoir in the Colorado River, crystal clear water surrounded by nature. Of course, it's Nevada, so there's not many trees. It's a beautiful area, but very rocky, very remote from civilization. I would say at least a one hour drive from the closest little village. So beautiful place. So I head into this place and um, I arrive around, I would say, 7, 7.15 plus or minus. And uh, start to set up my roads, my equipment, my gears. So I like to fish for carp. So carp here in the U.S. is not a great challenging fish for many people, but I like it because they get big. So for me, catching big fish is the, <laughs> is the trio. So I head into this place, uh, setting a camp, uh, putting up a tent, because it's already getting a little warmer in the morning. 
and uh, yes, um, this beautiful beach uh, surrounded around this lake, Lake Mojave. And uh, there is a couple of people next to me, a couple of ladies that they camp as well at about, I would say, about 200 yards from my camp. So I'm there. We're not, I'm not alone. There's these people as well. So the people, the, perch, the, the, the beach is not super full. Let's say there, there is me and there is those people. So I uh, set up my camp. I start fishing. I have my dog with me, which is a little, I would say, kind of an Italian greyhound mix. Pretty skinny dog. Very, very, very aware of everything that's around you uh, at all time. If there is anything that's going on, he will know it before me all the time. So for me, it's a great help when I go around in the woods or outdoor. It's always nice to have a dog. So at this point, um, so I'm there fishing. So I set my rods in the water and I'm just relaxing, light up my cigar uh, in my chair, beautiful day, feet in the water. I'm like, oh, I'm in paradise. So um, at one point, I see my dog acting a little weird. So he came next to me. And he's uh, touching me with his body and he's pointing in a direction with his tail up. So, and I know why he does that sometimes. It's because he sees coyotes or he sees any other animals around. And he usually does a little cry sound like, mm, you know, like a dog can do. And um, instead, this morning was just next to me and pointing in a direction and no sound, nothing whatsoever. And I look at him and I say, what's going on, Nino? What's going on? And then I look up to the direction that he was looking. And I'm like, just stuck with my eyes on this thing, on this uh, animal or whatever he was. At about 100 yards from where I was, in top of a rocky hill. So... I know very well this hill, so I know very well because I've been there before and I checked the area before my fishing trip, and I'm like, I know that hill, it's clear, there's nothing on top, there's no bush, there's no trees, there's nothing. Now I see this, uh, I would rather say six foot tall ball of hair like on a, on a gigantic amount of hair and long hair, I would say at least they was flying with the little breeze of that morning in the air, and there was at least 10 inch long hair. Light colored, not black, I would say on a light brown. And uh, this thing was just standing over there, and my dog was looking straight at him too, as I was. And he did not make a sound. He did not cry. He did not try to go over and see what was. Sometimes he start to step over that anything or any animal that he that he see. And he was just acting different. And I was actually acting very shocked too because I'm like, okay, this is not a mountain lion because I know how they look. This is not a bull rope which we have in the area. Buro is the donkey, the, the wild donkey that we have in the area, wasn't. Uh, and that's not a coyote. So there's no bear in this area. So I'm like, what is that? So it, it's very weird when you see an animal and, or, or any kind of creature and you cannot point on what it is. And I never had that feeling in my life. But that morning, I had that feeling that I'm looking at something that is not of this world for what I see. So even now, actually talking about, I still have goosebumps. Every time I'm talking about this creature or this animal or this dogman, now that I know what it is, I get these chills all over my body because it was um, unexplained sight. So something that look at you, that you know is there, and 
what I noticed because the 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 the, 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 the moment that I look at this this team, I thought there was a long time, but the actually entire entire vision or the me looking at the animal, I don't think it lasts more than three to four seconds. But it was so intense that I almost feel like I lost the track of time. You know, it's like I look at him, he look at me, my dog was looking at it. And the funny things, and when all these things happened, those two ladies that I mentioned before, they was at about 60 to 70 yards from this thing. And they have two little dogs running on the beach. And this thing was looking, moving his head right and left. So he was looking at me, he was looking at them, was looking at me, was looking at them. Just his head, he was moving. But I could not picture the head. I could not picture any particular about the head. The only thing that I remember very well, and I see it very well, was the protuberance that he has between the shoulders, very large shoulders, uh, I would say at least five to six foot large shoulders, like almost like a big bodybuilder, I would say even more. And uh, those hair flying in the little breeze that we had that morning and this giant, like a hump on the back of his shoulder. So, the ladies did not notice this creature over there. Their dogs either, they just was lurking around the beach and playing around. I was the only one seeing it. And um, like I said, I don't get scared. But in that moment, I was scared. I feel something inside me that says this is way over what you can do to protect yourself if this thing is charging at us or anything like that i don't know if i can protect anybody in this ditch or myself either so it was a moment that scares me actually yeah now going through the description of this creature so um like i say it was light hair so light brown Nothing, nothing, nothing dark, nothing black. I could not see the head. I could only see the shape that moves because this big hump in the back of his shoulder, it was actually uh, kind of covering the sun that was coming out from behind him. And uh, I see the two skinny legs in the back. And I see the two more in the front. So, but he was not standing. He was on four legs. But I can definitely say that the back legs, they were super skinny, very skinny, almost like inappropriate to sit below a, such a large body. You know, it was like almost like mm, not balanced. You know, and when nature makes something, it's usually as a balance. This thing was not balanced properly. The top was too big, the, the shoulder they was too big compared to the legs or to what was supporting this giant body. Now, the front legs, I cannot really see much. It was really airy, more maybe than the back one, but I cannot really see exactly how they look because he, he, uh, the, the position he was on it, his body was basically almost like sitting on these rocks. I wouldn't say exactly sitting, but uh, almost like crouching down. So then at one point, of course, I put the leash, the leash on my dog because I want him to stay with me and I want him to go in any direction of this creature. While I was putting the leash and I was attaching him, um, uh, I remember I look back up and I see him turning, so turning really fast, really fast, like um, like he was scared or like he get, I don't know, he wants to get away from us. So I see him turning and just crawl down fast as a, I would say, I have this in my mind since uh, the first time I speak about this encounter. So I almost feel like he was so fast, like a, a dirt bike was going downhill. So I see this creature jumping down those rocks 
as fast as I can see him turning, he was already down on the backside of the rock. So I cannot see him anymore. He just disappeared from my view behind the ledge of the rocks. And I see the dust basically coming out behind the, 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 the rocks. So when I see all this dust flying in the air, I'm like, man, that tells me that what I see was there. It's not just me imagining anything. This thing was there. I see the dust now in the air of this creature running downhill behind those rocks. So my dog continues to still look in that direction, attach it to me, and uh, look. I'm looking at the ladies like to see if they even you know, realize what was going on just 60, 60 feet behind there, probably 60 yards, I would say, behind there. And uh, no, they was talking, they was loud, they was having a very loud conversation with each other, you know, maybe a few drinks, you know how it goes when people start talking, especially ladies. And I was looking at that in the direction of those rocks, completely silent, completely mobilized, because I don't know what to do here. And I was scared even for their little dogs because they were just humming around the entire beach. And I think this creature maybe was aiming for them because that's my only thinking of why this thing was over there. Or was that for hunting us? Was that for hunting the dogs? Those are my questions. So I can't really answer those questions, but I know that that thing was there. And... Um, I cannot describe it. So I, when I see him going and I see the dust and he was gone, I keep looking in the same direction for another at least three or four minutes to be sure that this thing was gone and was not coming back at us in another direction. So then my, my dog went quiet and he, he, he started to, to relax. So I see his tail was still down to his legs instead of up. My dog has a as a short tail because when he born, he didn't born with the entire tail, so he only have a piece of his tail. And his tail was back down his, in a set position. When dog usually have a tail between the legs, we say, it's because they're afraid or they're sad or they see something that they can't explain. And that's exactly what happened to him. He was still, he was still scared. So I pet him up a little by making more, you know, tranquil and you know and he start to relax but he was still keeping looking at that the area you know he was still there because he could definitely feel it more than me that this this creature was keep running or whatever he went dogs can hear much longer than we human do so i know he was still feeling it so another confirmation for me because i was so shocked that i'm like did I see what I see? Um, like I asked question myself because, <laughs> you know, what was that? So it was pretty intense. It sure sounds like it was. Did having your encounter in such a beautiful place tarnish your love of the outdoors to at least a small degree? Yes, I would say yes, because uh, if I go out there again, which I'm planning to do, like I did when I went back to research, uh, I always carry a weapon with me. Um, you know, Nevada is a free carry state, so I carry my gun with me. Now there is a rule that you can carry in parks as well, so I will not go empty-handed. Yeah, so I will definitely do that and take my phone with me all the time just in case I can film, I can do anything. But yeah, so we go there with different thoughts, even in the daylight, because actually that's what happened to me. You know, some people I hear, I, I, after my research, I went to the internet and I look at videos. I actually listened to a few of your interviews about the dogman encounter. And um, I see things with a different eye. And um, I'm for sure after the day now, I can declare myself into a research. I'm going to be a dogman research. I'm sure, I'm sure 100% I'm already thinking of what I can do. I'm already thinking about going back to that area and uh, research more, ask people around, uh, ask for sure the village people about, and see if there's nothing coming up or anything can come up from those stories. You know, If anybody ever see it, if anybody have an encounter or testimony, 
I will research. I will research for sure. It, it changed me in two ways, yes, because I'm going to be a little more aware when I'm outdoor and I'm going to be for sure listening to my dog more or whatever he does <laughs> because they for sure know and feel and see better than we do. So yes, for sure. One more description that I have to say is, I remember I told you in the first time we met, about the three days after, you know, about the three days after when I start to realize that I see that creature, I, I realize it in my brain, I finally can come true and say, yes, I, what I see was what I see. And I talked with my family. I told them about it. And um, everybody was like really, really supporting on it. It was like, you know, hey, well, if you see it, you know, we know that you're always out there. If you see something weird, we know it was something weird because I can't really describe and see and be very, very precise of recognizing any animal in the woods or, or outdoor. I'm pretty keen on that snakes, uh, reptiles, any kind of animal, I, I can't really know what they are. And it's my passion to study animals. Wherever I go in the world, I know I want to know what's out there. I want to see them. I want to, you know, I want to have an experience. And uh, so once I came up with the idea of going back there and uh, looking for signs, for anything, from clue, for anything that this animal could leave, a trace of itself, I don't know, hair, uh, a footstep or, you know, footprint or anything like that. So three days later, I jump back in my car, take my gun with me, take <laughs> all my protection, my dog, and head to the place again. So while I was driving down there already, I had that feeling uh, like back to my spine, you know, like this goosebumps, this uh, kind of weirdness. The more I was getting close to the area, more I was feeling it. But I'm like, okay, well, like, let's go. It's another, it's, it's today you're protected, you have your gun, you, you just got to look for your traces and whatever. So I went to the place, I parked in the same spot, and I just walk towards that little hill when I see this animal. So I realized that the hill was basically 100 yards, 99, 98 yards from where I was camped. So how do I know that? Well, I know that because I bring my scope. You know, the scope for hunting have reticles. And the reticles, when you do long, long shooting range like I do, they have a way to measure distance and objects are a uh, uh, distance. So I, I'm, I'm like putting the scope from, from my car to that hill and, and try to figure it out the height of this creature. So how tall that thing was. I want to know exactly how tall that thing was. And I come up with exactly six foot something, six foot maybe and a half. I cannot really go to the inch. But I can tell you that that thing was six foot and it was not standing. It was on its four poles. So I can only imagine how that thing can be if he lift himself on two legs. That's going to be a nine footer easily. So um, kind of a big animal. And uh, so I measured that and I was shocked myself. And I'm like, okay, so I saw what I saw and that's what the size was. So I'm sure now I have no clue that that was the size. And I was surprised how close it actually was for, for me, but was closer to the two ladies. The two ladies that was basically under this hill was, they were the, if that thing would have run and wanted to hunt his, their, their dogs or, or those people, they, he would have surely, surely get to them in, in a matter of seconds. So... I went to the hill, I walked to the hill, and as, as, as I get to the hill, I'm seeing those rocks. And I'm a climber, like we were, like I uh, was telling you the, the before, so I know it's not easy for somebody to grab onto those rocks, to any other animals that I know, 
they can grow up to those rocks and actually climb on top of that little stone hill. So I, I know that from the front was not going to be a case. I could have done it with my climbing shoes, but it could have been tough. It's, it's, it's kind of a very, very high-grade climb. It's not a long climb. It's probably about 14 feet high, 15 feet high, but not doable. So I went to the back where he actually ran away from me. And even from the back, to be able to go on top of this rock, it would be a challenge for any human, for any person with a suit, for anybody that can maybe try to emulate anything like that. There is a, a, a way to describe when you have those encounters, yes, you want to be sure 100% of what you see it wasn't another animal. So for me to prove that was actually to go to the place and see how this animal could have gone on top of those rocks, you know. So, like I say, I went in the back, and even from the back, it was going to be a challenge for any kind of human or, or any kind of, maybe a goat could go over there. But even for a goat, goat, they jump on rocks and they do all this stuff, but... It was just too steep, you know. It was almost a climbing degree. You can actually climb that place. If you are a climber, that's what I would look for to climb, to make a challenge. So I'm like, where is this animal going on top of these things? There's no way they can go up in that thing. He may jump over there. That's what my conclusion was. I say, is, is this thing actually jump on top of that thing? He can actually jump 15 feet high in the air because that's how it looks to me. Now, thinking about when this animal turned his back on me and ran away. So I say, okay, why did I see that dust coming up? Why did I, this is just rocks. So I, I managed to go on behind the, the rocks on the better side, easier way to go up. And I actually climbed on top of this thing. And I don't see any mark or any footprints because it's pure rock. And, you know, in Nevada, it never rains, so uh, we don't see rain sometimes for six months, seven months. So the place is dry, 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 dry. So the only thing you can see is dust. And uh, I look around, I look around from to the top of this rock, and I did not see anything that looks like a mark or anything that he could have lived in, in any of the of the sand that was below the, the rock. There was a little bit of sand. So before I come back down, I actually look from the rock towards my car, and I'm like, wow, this thing could have seen anything I was doing from here. Who, who knows how long it was there for? It was climbing on us or whatever, until he probably realized that I saw him looking at us. So that was my feeling and my conclusion of the top of the rock. So then I came down to the rock, back down to, to the ground, and I look, and I look at where do I see this dust flying over? And now I know what, what I see. What I see was actually not even dust, was all this sand that is below this rock. And, uh, you know, this uh, fine, fine, uh, let's say that when it's raining, if it's raining, there would be mud. But since the mud is so dry, so what happened here in the summer, in the longer months, it doesn't rain, it turns into a dust. So that's what the dust that I see when he ran away. So I went over there and I checked this dust as well to see if I can spot a foot mark, a footprint or anything. Nothing, nothing. Unfortunately, I couldn't see it. And I was looking for air or for anything or for, uh, you know, aspirin that he could have leave. But nothing that was looking weird, nothing that was looking off, you know. So, unfortunately, I didn't find anything. But I tried to walk towards the side of the mountain that he probably was running into. It was a, it's, it's like a dry creek that it's basically called a wash. It's when it's raining a lot, that's when the water washed out to the reservoir, to the Lake Mojave. So, he probably chose that path to run away from us and go wherever he wanted to go. But that could have been a path. That could have been a place. The only problem is that even there I couldn't find any footprints because it's full of small stones like river stones. So 
there's not much to live on a river store. So while I was working there, I thought I was going to work a little further, but then I didn't want to because um, too much bushes around on both sides of this wash. And I don't want to be in a spot where I can be ambushed quickly from the bush, from anything that is around, uh, especially my dog. So I'm like, no, I'm not going to walk that wash. I'm not going to take that path. Uh, I'm alone, so I'm not going to do it. Maybe come back with somebody, with friends, and uh, then we can maybe follow the wash and see what it takes if we find anything. But I, I didn't feel to do it alone that day. I have that creep coming up my back again, and that feeling of goosebumps behind my back being there where he was, you know, I was like, okay, this is his territory. I don't want to invade his territory because maybe that's what animals do, you know, they may protect in their territory. And I don't want to be part of that right now. I'm not prepared. I'm alone. Uh, so I, I came, I, I, I head back from that place straight to my car, stayed there for a few more minutes, looking around, was nobody that morning, was there almost the same time. When I get there, it was about 8 o'clock, 8.30. Uh, well, there was nobody in the area, so I uh, just say, you know what, well, yeah, let's, let's head home for now. But it, it was a breakthrough for me, so it was not that easy to be back there. And honestly telling you, feeling completely sure of myself. I was feeling a little bit weird. I had that. You know, those hair in the back of my head sometimes standing up. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to be here any longer alone. I don't blame you for getting cold feet. I'm impressed the fact that you went back out there and took a good look around. Yeah, alone. I should have bring somebody. You should have, but everything went fine. So no harm, no foul. Did you decide to research dogmen because you want to prove their existence to the world, Walter, or because you want to learn more about them? Well, I would say both. I would say both. I, I want to know myself more about, and I want to know. I want to. I want to know what they're doing, what they live, what they eat, how they reproduce. I mean, uh, like, uh, there's a whole study here. There's no registration on anything on papers, or nobody ever. You know, I mean, there is people that encountered them, but nobody ever found a body. Nobody ever killed one or maybe I see a video that somebody say that they may kill one. But even that body is gone. There's no enough proof. So why not? Why not just go deep on this thing and figure it out what's going on? So I think once you experience it yourself, it's like it's open a door to that world. It's opening a door. It says, well, I'm here, you see me, and now what? Well, now I want to know more. I can't just close that door and forget about it. No, <laughs> it's, not, it's not me. <laughs> I'm a very curious person, and when something weird happened, I want to know what's going on. I'm definitely going to be, become a researcher. You would see my name somewhere. I'm not a guy that do social media, uh, so that's not going to be anything that I will do, but if I have to pair with somebody or open a research in this area, I would be more than happy to do that. I would be more than happy to do that. Well, you're a good man, Walter. Whatever direction you decide to take this, I wish you nothing but the best of luck. I don't know how you would do it, but do you have any desire to warn people in that area about it being around? Yeah, what I will do, like I said before, I will definitely go to that village. That is, uh, I would say the name of the village just because I don't want to make like, um, because you know how things get in America sometimes, they go crazy. If, you know, the people just go and float the area. <laughs> you know, I don't want anything like that to happen to this little quiet village. But I will definitely go there myself alone or with a friend. And just maybe interview people and see, you know, ask a few questions around, you know, go to the local bar and see, hey, you ever guys ever hear any, you know, weird stories, any huntsmen here or anybody that hunting or goes out or have any, you know, it's just starting from zero and see what's coming up. 
that is in the back of my mind and I'm planning to do it. As soon as I have a little bit of time, I'm planning to do it. I don't want to do this one too far away from, from now because my my sighting was shortly time, you know, was about what was the seventh of yeah, seventh of April, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. That was the day. And uh, you know, I wanna keep it fresh. So I wanna see what's going on right now. Maybe see if I can uh, find somebody in that place that knows about some story or some encounter. Why not? If that thing is there, I'm thinking that I'm probably not the only one seeing it. It's probably being seen by somebody else. That's my plan. Oh, I'm sure you're right. I'm sure other people around that area have seen it. How big is Lake Mojave, Walter? Well, Lake Mojave is pretty big. It's not as big as giant as Lake Mead, which is his little brother. His, his, we can call it the brother of Mead, but it's a big reservoir. Not exactly knowing how, about the size right now. I will have to Google it, but uh, it's a big, big reservoir. The, the, the coastline is pretty big. Let's say that from side to side, from where I was to the other side, it's about uh, five mile large. So Wow. It's a big water reservoir. It's part of the Colorado River. So if you want to know more, you can definitely Google it and take a look at the area. And uh, I can definitely mention the area where I was on. The area I was on is uh, basically Lake Mojave and it's called Nine Miles Beach. It's called Nine Miles Beach, not because it's the Nine Miles Beach, but because to get to the beach, you need to drive nine miles on a dirt road. Uh, it basically was a was before was a telephone line, so that's why they built these roads to go all the way down to the Moave water. Uh, it's a very remote area, desert. All this desert, you only see few bushes around. Very dusty, very rocky. Coyotes are the main animals down there. The predators, turtles. Uh, what else? Uh, burros, which are the donkeys. Uh, lots of birds, eagles, a lot of aquatic animals. But yes, yeah, so you are in the middle of the desert. You have a lot of water in front of you, but the rest is desert. So it's a great area. Now, in the area, now that I remember, I mentioned it once, and I know because I researched after my encounter. In the area, there is a, it's called the Mojave Reservation. And it's very close to where I had the encounter. It's part of the park. And there is a Mojave cemetery at about less than a mile to where I was. So reading about those dogmen and skinwalkers, I read about skinwalkers. They look pretty much, I mean, I don't know if, if I can call it the same, creature but it looks pretty much the same and i know that the indian tribes uh, describe those skinwalkers and they are usually describe them as a course if, or because they've been uh, lands piece of lands that they've been cursed or because some very bad crimes between i don't know the time of the west civilization and indians or whatever happened in those remote areas and Indian cemetery proximity are usually very possible to have a look at those skinwalkers or dogmen. So that could be a related fact about my encounter. You're right. It just might be related. It's hard to say, and it does make you wonder. You said it was on all fours when you saw it and that it had a hump on its back. Did it look to you like the top of its hump was higher than its ears? Yeah, for where I'm looking, yes, because uh, I could not see his ears and uh, I could not see his face because of the, the sun position was actually in, a, in, a, in an angle that I couldn't, it was not illuminating his face. So um, I cannot describe that. But yes, the hump was over his head. He was. A gigantic hump. I would say almost if you look at a camel, you know, the camel hump, 
something like that. And those giant shoulders, I mean, those giant shoulders are in my in my mind, the hump and the giant shoulders. I see this thing, it's like, what the, what, what is that? I mean, it's, 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 it's massive. It's, 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 I describe it, if I have to describe it in one word, what I see, that thing was a beast. That thing was not an animal, that thing was a beast. Yeah, sounds like that's a great way to describe it. Did the overall impression you got of it make it seem like it was healthy or somewhat sickly? No, that thing was far away from being sick. That thing was in good shape. What it tells me that it was in good shape is that I think the air, the air, the way it was looking, almost like, um, like I said, the color was light brown and it was long. So it was long and healthy hair, you know, it was a lot of hair and it was long. Like I said, they must have been a 10 inch when you have kind of long hair and they blow in the wind. That's that's the effect that I see over there. It was this kind of breeze pushing from the right side on his hair. And the color, you know, it was it was this this brownish, almost like burned by the sun, you know, when like a surfer hair, let's say, you know, burned by the sun. That means that this creature is in a desert, so it, it can't be dark, you know, because all the creatures that live in those deserts, they, they are light colored. They, they, they can't have dark hair it's because they're going to be too warm in the summer. The summer here can get to 120, 122 sometimes in the middle of the day. So they probably, by nature or by whatever, they have a different coloration of the hair. I will assume myself that if I dog man lives in the bushes or in a in a green area uh, surrounded by trees, surrounded by shade all day, probably his hair would be darker. It's almost like maybe they were uh, lighter because of the sun exposure. Being always in the sun. Yeah, being always in the sun, you know, it, it, it turned the air of anybody lighter, you know. If you go to the beach every day, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a blur guy. If I go to the beach every day or in the sun every day, my hair turns a little more lighter than usual. So that's what I was thinking. Why is this thing that has not the color of everybody seeing? Because I'm hearing stories on the web and I'm reading and, you know, I'm researching right now and everybody's talking about this dark black hair and I'm like, man, that was a, that thing has nothing black. That thing was blonde. That thing was hairy, very hairy, but nothing black. It would go a little darker to his legs, but I cannot really confirm that because I did not put too much of attention in his leg. Like I say, my encounter was very short. I didn't look at that creature no longer than three, four seconds, max, max. So... I cannot really tell. 90 yards is not that far in the middle of the day. You know, you can see pretty much well. But in those moments when you see something, your mind is, doesn't really look to look really well a particular. I think you are mostly shocked. And your mind is like there realizing what are you looking at, you know. There's too much going on in those three or four seconds. I don't know if, if I explain myself good, but sometimes the mind, it's cannot really go at the same speed that you want it to go because it's like not enough time. But I can remember the color very, very well. It's printed in my mind, the shoulder, the hump, and this air fluctuating in the breeze, uh, looking almost like what animal can look like that, I would say. The same color of can be a cougar, you know, like uh, like they, they we have them in, in Nevada. Now, of course, they have short hair. They don't have long hair. Uh, yes, the same color, that kind of gold brown, you know. And I hear people describing tails, long tails or hairy tails, but I did not see a tail of this thing. When he turns, when he turns and run away from me, so when he turns... And, and move away in the back of that rock, I could not see anything. It was super fast. Like I said, this thing was fast. And I could describe like it was fast as a cat. 
So imagine putting the, the nerves and the action of a cat onto a wolf. This thing works fast. Onto a wolf, then on steroids mixed with a human. That's what what's that's what the mix, the old mix that I come out with, it will it will describe this future. That was a mixture of a of a, of a man features and a wall feature that it was uh, was who had both in the same DNA, I think. The way he was moving, you know, when he moves back and disappear, it was like wow. I was blown away. I still, every time I think about it, I'm still like, having this picture so clear in my mind, you know, so clear that I saw it yesterday. And I, I believe it's going to be the same way in a year. I don't think I would ever forgot that. Oh, I'm sure you won't. Yeah, I don't know how you could. If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, please go to dogmanencounters.com forward slash podcast. After seeing something like that, though, Walter, why in the world did you stay? Why didn't you leave immediately? That's the funny part about it. Why did I stay? Why did I leave? Because I was not even believing that I see it. I was still in a, in a shock state. I was like, I don't even want to think about what would happen. You know what I mean? I was like, I don't know. So why did I stay? Because I did not figure it out. I did not realize yet why my didn't. It doesn't make me realize what I see was there. I, I, like I say, I, I think about this as a self-protection of myself that says nothing was there. There was just a glare. There was just an imagination. I wasn't really processing that that animal was on that hill. Later on, when I was keep looking my back, and then I was like, why am I keeping looking my back? Did I see that thing? That thing was there. Am I afraid? Because like I say, I'm never afraid. I'm, I'm a guy that really can go through hell and back and just take a walk. It's like taking a walk on the park. But I feel weird that day, you know? But I, I, I couldn't call it fear yet. The fear came three days after. That's when I start to realize and I'm like, wow, man, I want to go back down there. But now I'm realizing what happened that day. I'm starting to realize that that thing was over there looking at me, you know, looking at us, at those two ladies and the dogs. He was spying. He was looking what we was doing. He was maybe waiting for an opportunity to, to unleash on us. Who knows? So I'm like, I figure it out later. I have, it takes me a while to process all this stuff. I was kind in kind of a shock. I didn't even want to believe it myself. I was like, no, that, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. That, almost as a self-convincing state of mind. Let's call it like that. People respond in strange ways when they have dogman encounters, so it's not just you. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here, Walter, but before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Uh, Number seven and those animals are in some way related because I read something about this number seven on the 17 on the seven. I don't know that day was the seven and that thing show up. So I don't know if there is anything correlated to that. I'm always been a fan of number seven. My date of birth is 76. I'm kind of surrounded by seven in all my life. So I don't know if there is any connection. Well, I'm not too sure there's anything to that. It might just be an old wives' tale about dogmen. There might be something to it, but I don't know. I think the odds are on the side of there not being anything to it. But who knows? I guess we'll never know. But having said that, I want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing the details of that experience with us, Walter. I really appreciate it. Oh, it was a great pleasure to share. It was a great pleasure. You are a great host. Well, thank you, sir. It's been great having you on. Thanks again so much for your time and have a great night.